So, imagine the setting. A steamy tropical island ruled by a military dictator, with the smell of revolution in the air. The capital city is a decadent playground of the rich and famous, run by mafia bosses who peddle girls, drugs and booze. Set against this backdrop, a glamorous racing event attracting playboys and professionals alike. But on the eve of the race, the world champion has been kidnapped by armed revolutionaries, and in his absence, a rookie driver pushes his car to the limit, seeking triumph but finding only tragedy. Now, you'd be forgiven if you thought that what I was describing there was just the plot of a Pulp Fiction paperback. But in fact, it all really happened. This is the story of the kidnapping of Juan Fancho and the turbulent and tragic events of the infamous 1958 Cuban Grand Prix. By all accounts, the Cuba of the 1950s was a land of extremes. Extreme wealth and indulgence side by side with poverty and squalor. Cuba was ruled by a military dictator, Fulgencio Batista, who had seized power in 1952, overturning the democratic process and installing himself as a provisional president. You know, that kind of provisional president that somehow never manages to leave office. Batista ran Cuba like a street gang runs a busy corner, and cronyism and corruption flourished. The capital city, Havana, was described as a hedonistic playground for the world's elite, where cigars and booze could be bought in any bar on any corner, along with girls, drugs and anything else which took your fancy. Casinos had sprung up all over the city, many of them run by the American gangsters Lucky Luciano and Mayor Lansky, who were allowed to operate in Cuba in return for providing the Batista regime with hefty kickbacks. It was a big party town, and it was no surprise to see Hollywood bigwigs, US politicians and the high rollers of Wall Street rubbing shoulders with gangsters and hoods in the casinos and restaurants of Havana during the 1950s. Of course, with only a select few enjoying the riches, it was inevitable that some form of pushback would occur. As historian Arthur Schlesinger wrote in 1956, The corruption of the government, the brutality of the police, the government's indifference to the needs of the people for education, medical care, housing, social justice and economic justice is an open invitation to revolution. The inevitable revolution came in the form of the July 26th movement, headed by none other than Fidel Castro. His armed militia were based in the mountainous and inaccessible region of the Sierra Maestra and they'd been a thorn in Batista's side throughout the 1950s. As Batista used his police and secret police to arbitrarily arrest, detain, torture and murder suspected malcontents, Castro's group began to gather support amongst ordinary Cubans. And so it was against this backdrop of a military dictator slowly losing his grip on power whilst armed rebels were waiting in the jungle that the first Cuban Grand Prix was staged. Debuting in 1957, in a bid to boost Batista's local popularity and the tourist trade, the Havana Grand Prix took place during what many regard as the golden age of motor racing. Now, personally, I'm not a huge motor racing fan, but even I've heard of Sterling Moss and Carroll Shelby, two of the more famous drivers who competed there. A firm fan favourite at the Cuban Grand Prix was the man who many considered to be the top racing driver of the era. 46-year-old motor racing world champ, Juan Fancho. The event was totally in keeping with the playboy image of Havana, attracting amateur drivers keen to compete alongside the pros. Drivers like Count Alfonso de Portago, a young, handsome Spanish aristocrat, fluent in four languages, and whose hobbies, apart from motor racing, included stunt flying, horse racing, being the captain of the Spanish bobsleigh team, and dating good-looking female film stars. You get the picture. The cars were amazing, the girls were beautiful, the drivers were handsome daredevils, and everyone was out for a good time. The Havana Grand Prix had glamour and excitement in spades, but the good times were not to last. As the first Grand Prix in 1957 had been a great success, it was a no-brainer to host the race the following year. 
1958 Grand Prix would follow the same course as the 1957 race, a three-mile circuit through the streets of Havana, the highlight being the run down the seafront esplanade of the Malacon, where cars would reach speeds of up to 160 miles an hour. It was all exciting, thrilling, dangerous stuff. The crowds which thronged the sidewalks of Havana really felt close to the action, mainly due to the fact that there were no crash barriers, sandbags or even hay bales to protect them from the cars which roared past just inches from where they stood. For Batista, the race was a great piece of pro-regime propaganda, a chance for him to be seen in the company of famous faces like Fancho, Shelby and Moss. It was for exactly the same reason that Castro set his sights on disrupting the race. He wanted a headline-grabbing event that would bring world attention to his revolutionaries and his cause. Now most of the race drivers were staying in central Havana at the Hotel Lincoln. It was here that on the evening before the race was due to start, as Juan Fancho was making his way through the lobby on his way to dinner, he was accosted by a bearded young man brandishing a pistol. At first, Fancho thought it was just a joke, but there were no smiles from the young man with the gun. Fancho was hustled outside at gunpoint and bundled into a waiting car. The world champion had just been kidnapped on the night before the race. President Batista was furious. He was determined to save face and would not allow the race to be cancelled. The remaining drivers spent a rather worrisome night in their rooms at the Hotel Lincoln with armed guards outside the doors. The precaution was not without merit, as Castro had also planned to kidnap Sterling Moss. However, Fancho managed to convince his kidnappers not to do so, making up a story that Moss was on his honeymoon and it would be seen as being in very poor taste to abduct a guy who just got married. Fancio's abduction had made press all around the world and Castro had the headlines that he wanted, but he needed to make good press out of this, and so, in a somewhat ironic turn for kidnappers in general, Castro's men were taking great pains to ensure Fancio was unharmed and treated well. Indeed, their main fear was that Batista's police would find them and kill them all, including Fancio. If that happened, Batista would turn the situation to his own advantage, being able to blame the killing on Castro. The kidnappers just needed to keep Fancio hidden for 24 hours, so they kept him happy. A slap-up meal of steak and potatoes, some good wine, amenable company, and a comfy bed for the night. As race day dawned with no sign of the world champ, and after a somewhat jittery delay of about an hour, the 1958 Havana Grand Prix finally got underway, and it was to be a memorable race. Memorable for all the wrong reasons. As the 50 lap race got underway, downtown Havana shook with the sound of roaring engines as the Maseratis, Porsches and Ferraris tore through the old streets and raced down the Malecon. Spectators waved and cheers as the cars flashed by, but on the track things were rapidly deteriorating. There seemed to be oil on the road at some of the corners, and this was no problem for the professional drivers, but not everyone who was racing that day had a ton of experience. In fact, it was a disaster just waiting to happen, and 13 minutes into the race, it happened. Local rookie driver Armando Kifuentes, driving his first race for Ferrari, skidded on the oil. In a panic, he slammed on his brakes, and the car went spinning out of control. Travelling at an estimated 110 miles an hour, and with pretty much no warning, his car ploughed directly into a large group of spectators who were gathered on a crowded corner. The devastation was immediate and awful. A report from the time described it like this. The car lurched from side to side, spun like a top, and somersaulted through the crowd. The terrific impact knocked victims out of their shoes, and more than 20 feet into the air. Seven people were killed and over 50 injured. That was the official toll, although Ferrari driver Phil Hill stated afterwards, I didn't take anybody's pulse, but I saw a lot more than that who looked mighty dead to me. Porsche driver Ulf Noriden had stopped and attempted to help. He said, I couldn't even see the Ferrari. The bodies were piled all over. I was just wading through arms and legs. 
There is some British Pathé newsreel footage of the actual crash. I've put the link in the description, but as always, viewer discretion is advised. In the confusion, the race continued on for a minute until red flags began to be waved around the track. The lead driver slowed down, passing by the scene of the chaos. After just six laps, the race was already over. As the cars headed slowly back towards the finish line, the ever-competitive Sterling Moss suddenly accelerated to sneak in front of the leading car and take the victory. He became the winner of what has become one of the most infamous races in motor racing history. The cause of the oil spill was hotly contested, and in the aftermath, Batista and Castro supporters were accusing each other of sabotage. It seems that the actual reason was that one of the Porsches had suffered a broken oil pipe, and the whole event was simply a terrible accident. There was no 1959 Grand Prix, because at the same time the following year, the Batista regime had fallen and Castro was in power, and the rest, as they say, is history. President Fulgencio Batista, realising that his days were numbered, fled Cuba on the 1st of January 1959, along with 40 members of his family and inner circle. He is rumoured to have taken with him an estimated $700 million fortune, amassed through the corruption and kickbacks from his time as being Cuba's leader. At the invitation of fellow dictator Salazar, he settled in Portugal, living out his days in the fashionable Lisbon suburb of Estoril. He died of a heart attack in 1973. His regime is estimated to have killed over 20,000 Cuban citizens. Having nabbed first place, Sterling Moss decided to pool the winnings for first place with the second place driver, so they each took home a fair share. It was preferable to holding an inquiry and seeing the money held in trust by Cuban lawyers. The prize money was paid in cash, in paper bags. Both drivers seemed happy with that. The Ferrari driver, Armando Cifuentes, was himself seriously injured in the crash. His teammate pulled him from the wreck, laid him on the bonnet of his car and drove him to the local hospital. Two days later, he was charged with manslaughter while he was still in intensive care, fighting for his own life. World champion Juan Fancho was released after 27 hours of captivity into the care of the Argentinian embassy. He had nothing but good things to say about his kidnappers, and he returned to Cuba several times over the course of his life, meeting Fidel Castro and the men who kidnapped him under much better circumstances. His record of five world championship wins stood unequalled until 2003, and he is still ranked today as one of Argentina's greatest sportsmen. As for the Spanish playboy aristocrat Alfonso de Portago, well, they don't say live fast, die young for nothing. At age 28, he was killed whilst competing in a road race in northern Italy. A tyre blew out on his Ferrari whilst he was driving at around 150 miles an hour, the car flipped, and he was killed instantly, along with his co-driver and nine spectators. This photograph was taken a few minutes prior to the accident, and shows him and his fiancée, the actress Linda Christian, in the pit stop just before the fatal accident. The haunting photograph is known as the Kiss of Death. Castro's coming to power was the nail in the coffin for the short-lived Cuban GP. One last race was held in 1960, but by all accounts it was a downbeat affair, being held out at the airport and was marshalled by children who were toting AK-47s. Deciding that motor racing was just too bourgeois for the new socialist Cuba, the event was banned, and, as far as I know, it has never been run since. <laughs>